That's quite a big audience who does not know speak good enough. I mean, I'm trying to work out how to organize the entire presentation, right? So, I, I mean, when, it, when we talk about microservices, I can talk about the architecture, entire architecture as well. But one of the fundamentals, uh, one of the important things that uh, I mean, that helps with the challenges in developing microservices is Spring. So, you need to be able to understand Spring and then is uh, microservices are small, right? So that's what you're saying. So it might be just a couple of services. Yeah. Uh, any other definitions of microservices? What, what, what does microservices represent for you? What is unique about microservices? Can I... Right. So what you're saying is uh, independent. So these are kind of independent and small services which do not impact each other. So I can deploy one without affecting the other. So you can bring up, bring them down very easily. So independent deployment. Any other? Any other? You are not locked to one network. Okay, that's a kind of a consequence, right? So how about building small? So you are not really uh, technology. It's not technology neutral. Okay, I don't know. I'll say. Okay, any other thing? Easy to test. Easy to scale. Makes life simpler. <laughs> Deep. Right, okay, I can. Any other thing? When we talk about a lot of these things, when, let's say, I am developing a mobile application, right? So when I'm trying to design a good uh, application, whether I'm forgetting all the microservices, whenever you're trying to design I think a good application, the one of the important things that we try to do is to keep things open, right? So whether you're developing a method, whether you're developing a class, a package, a jar, or whatever, you want always things to be as small as possible. So that's Right, so the thing is, this small is one of the most important things when it comes to microservices, right? So, a combination of small and a combination of being able to deploy it independently, right? That's a powerful combination because when I'm able to take a small thing and I'm able to deploy it uh, independent of other components, then it provides me with a lot of flexibility, right? So, if you look at all the other stuff in here, for example, easy to test, that's a consequence of it being small. Because the microservices is small, it's easier to test. And when we talk about scalability, uh, the scalability we'll talk about it a little later in depth, and makes life simpler, obviously, and it makes it easy to adapt to agile because you would have smaller components, that means you can have smaller teams which can be built around these components. These teams can be independent from other teams, 
So it's not like I have a big application which is managed by uh, 25 developers. That would be difficult to do in an agile dev. You have a lot of agile plus plus methodologies which come into picture. <laughs> I don't want to go in there. Um, good. So this is basically what we talk about. Uh, like these are some of the important factors that we talk about when we uh, talk about microservices, right? So, uh, what do you think would be the important challenges when you are developing such smaller components, right? So it does not come free. Nothing comes free. So you are saying, like we are saying, uh, we want to develop a lot of smaller components, right? So what is the impact of uh, developing such smaller components. What do you think would be the impact? Number of nodes will be increased. Sorry? Number of nodes will Number of nodes. Let us see. Okay. Resources. Network latency. Network latency. Network latency. Manageability. Any other integration? Integration. Uh, scalability. What do you mean by that? Uh, why, would, why would it be a challenge? Yeah. Okay. Good. So what we are talking about now is like if you develop smaller components, what would be the challenges that you would be facing? Right, so what any other challenges that you can think of? Okay, so fault tolerance because these components are small, you'd want all of them to be uh, fault tolerant. Yeah, so you have to do a lot of deployments, right? So because you have smaller components, yeah, that's good. Any, any other? Debugging a problem, right? Because you have multiple services which interact with each other, debugging problems become very difficult. How do you assign the microservices to one another? Absolutely, that's I think the biggest challenge. How do you design the boundary of a microservice? Any other challenges? Security. I, I, right. I mean, it would be inside the internet. Yeah, security is kind of something I would say is not a challenge which is specific to microservices. I mean, you would want it, whether it's a monolith or a microservice. I think the challenges would almost be the same. Absolutely. Yeah. Versioning. Versioning in what sense? Right. So, uh, versioning, I think it's kind of related with more with the service design rest and things like that, right? So, it's not really a microservice specific challenge as such, but Version is definitely a challenge. Any other things? Identifying services. Identifying services. Yeah, I, I, I kind of fit it into the design boundaries. So identifying the design boundaries and identifying what should be the right services. Uh, any other challenges that you can think of? Okay, cool. I think most of the challenges are out there. One of the Biggest challenge with microservices is that instead of developing a large application, you'd be developing multiple small applications, right? So multiple small components, each of which is called a microservice, right? So these microservices, you need to build each one of them from zero, right? So that's where the challenge. Like if I'm setting up one big application, I can spend two months or a month or I can do a lot of work to set it up in the right way. But when it comes to microservices, because we are doing 
we are building a lot of them, you would want to be able to build a microservice very quickly. So you would want to be able to uh, create a microservice, let's say within a day, within a couple of days, and you'd be able to have a microservice which meets all the standards that are there in your organization. And that's where Spring Boot uh, plays a very important role. Spring Boot helps us to Spring Boot helps us to uh, create like services very I mean, create these components very very easily. Let's get started. Um, and uh, I'll skip this slide. Um, yeah, one of the most important reasons I started in 15 minutes is I, I, I mean I have a lot of experience working with developers around the world, and one of the things I it's a personal feeling and I also see it around is. Uh, as far as Indian programmers are concerned, I don't think as a proportion of number of programmers, the number of great programmers is very less. So uh, that's one of the things I would want uh, to work on. And also the other thing which I would want to focus on is trying to help people understand uh, the technology trends and also try and help them make the right career choices. Right? Uh, how many of you identified with this? People who are working with microservices, right? It's right. So today, whichever or wherever you go to, this is how we are talking about microservices. Anyway, I mean, you cannot attend a, a conference or meetup without the word uh, microservice being talked about, and this is how. Like the situation was in my organization, which I was working for earlier. Uh, everybody was so tired of hearing, hearing about microservices. Right? This was how it was. Don't say it one more time. <laughs> so it's like the thing is, uh, as with a lot of these buzzwords that we talk about, microservice is not really a silver bullet, right? So it uh, it is not something which. Uh, you would be able to say, okay, I have one of the application, I'll be able to convert it to microservices tomorrow. Right? I cannot, if you have a big application with, let's say, uh, a million lines of code, I mean, taking, uh, like refactoring it and building it into microservices is a long process. It's not going to be a very short, uh, like, quick thing. And it's like people who, uh, like, to really get the benefits out of whatever. Uh, like microservices are promising in terms of uh, being able to scale very easily. It's it, it's something which would take a long term plan. It's not something which is going to be short term. And this is was like some of the organizations are in this kind of a state. So as an industry, we love buzzwords, and microservices is the latest one. So. Uh, Microservices versus monolith, right? So that's what we have been talking about until now. So when we talk about monoliths, <laughs> typically these are large applications, right? So these are like some applications have 100,000 lines of code, some applications have million lines of code. And the consequence of having large application is having large release cycles, right? How many of you do releases every month? Five. How many of you do, do releases every like week? Great. So we have few people doing releases every week. How many of you do releases every day? Very few, right? So today, like one of the important reasons that we talk about release cycles is because for businesses to be successful, they need to be very dynamic, right? At the end of the thing. All the applications, all the technology that we create is there to serve a business. And that business is only going to be successful if it's very innovative and is able to adapt to the change of the needs of the market. If we are going to say, okay, you get a requirement today and it would take like three months before I would be putting it live, that might not be sufficient amount of uh, like, uh, responsiveness to enable your business to succeed. And that's where like the release cycles of these monoliths are a big problem. So these monoliths have large release cycles 
And obviously, as a consequence of the large board base, you would have large teams also maintaining it, right? So you would have very big teams which are managing these monolith applications. And scalability challenges are very much one of the biggest problems with monolith applications, right? So how many of you shopped a lot uh, during the uh, like uh, holiday season? Nobody shops a lot during the holiday season? Right, so the, if you take like for example Amazon, right, so they, the load on the applications, I mean the load, uh, like the number of users using Amazon will not be the same on every day of the year, right, so during the holiday season, what would happen? The number of hits go up drastically, so if, uh, for example, if you take something like a Thanksgiving day, Right? The load, typical load on a Thanksgiving day is five or six times the load which is present on all the other days. So what happens is I was working for uh, an organization um, which was into like insurance. They were kind of providing a platform for all the insurance companies so that they can actually enroll uh, their customers. So what happens with this kind of thing is we had peak period only during October and November. So during October and November, we have peak load, like it's like 50 times the load compared to all the other months. And all the other months, we had absolutely no load. And what we had in place was infrastructure which would handle the peak load. And what the infrastructure was doing for the rest of the time, it was just there sitting idle, right? That's really the business benefit that you would want when you go towards microservices, right? So when we are talking about microservices, what we are really talking about is cloud enabling. So what do you, like how many of you, uh, like, let's probably take this off. So when we talk about cloud, what does it represent to you? Sorry? Data everywhere at any time. Okay. So large data, is that any other? So when we talk about cloud, what does it really mean? Scalable infrastructure. Okay. Outsourced infrastructure. Any other? Higher availability. Sorry? Higher availability. High availability. Any other? High scalability. Any other? Agility. Agility. Agility in Okay, okay, I get what you're saying. So it's more sorry? <coughs> Services over internet. So it's kind of outsourced infrastructure, right? So your infrastructure is out. Yeah. So, any other pay, things? Pay as you use. Right? Pay as you use. Pay as you use. So, it's basically uh, on demand, right? On demand. Any other? Right? So, that's like the most important point about cloud is you just pay for what you need. Right? So, I, like if I want specific amount of infrastructure for a spe only like I can demand like I can take I can get infrastructure on demand right so whenever I need something I can ask for it and get it and that's that's kind of the most important reason why cloud is becoming popular right so you don't really need to have infrastructure sitting idle with you you just need to pay for what you need 
you don't really need to pay like uh, like for example with the organization that i was working for we were paying for uh, infrastructure which was sitting there idle for 10 months a year right for the other two months is when we really need it and for the other 10 months the high end infrastructure that we got is just sitting there idle it's not doing anything that's one of the main reasons why the like, cloud is so famous today and that's one of the reasons why microservices are also becoming a famous trend because microservices enable you to actually benefit from the cloud right so unless you have applications which are scalable which are dynamically scalable you will not be able to realize the benefits of the cloud so even though there is infrastructure out even though there are things out there which you can dynamically ask for unless you have applications which can benefit from it you will not really make use of the whole thing so typically monoliths have a lot of scalability challenges and also adapting to new technologies one of that was one of the points which was already discussed right so adapting to new technologies is very difficult when you have a monolith, right? You don't really want to have three or four or ten frameworks being used in the same application. So new technology ad adaption becomes a huge challenge with all these uh, monolith applications. Let's say you want to try a play framework or you want to develop uh, a specific API using Scala or you want to try Node.js for something. If you're having a monolith application, then it's much more difficult. But if you have, uh, if you have kind of microservices architecture, you can kind of have more flexibility with playing around with things. And obviously when you have large applications, implementing Agile in the right, like in the simplistic way would be difficult. And also things like automation testing, right? So you have no idea, like when I talk about monoliths, probably some of these applications have been developed uh, more than 10 years back. Uh, at a time when probably uh, unit testing was not even considered to be very important, right? So, doing writing automation tests for uh, like this kind of software is very very difficult. So, automation testing is a big question mark, and adapting to modern development practices is also difficult, right? So, if writing unit tests is difficult, then there's no chance that you can do TDD or something, BDD or things like that, right? So. These are typically the problems with uh, monoliths. The other thing which is ha which has been consistently happening over the last decade is the number of new devices, right? So earlier, where, like if I go a decade back, it's just a laptop that you are serving to, right? A laptop or a computer, a desktop. But now you have laptops, iPads, and you have hundreds of varieties of mobiles which you are serving to. So there are I mean, the number of devices that we are serving to is much larger and their needs are very different. So what you would want to serve for a desktop is completely different from what you would want to serve on a mobile. So in that sense there is a huge amount of device explosion and customizing the monoliths to be able to do this is very tough. And one of the solutions which is being proposed is what we have been talking about until now, it's microservices. Um, the thing about microservices is there is no one definition for microservices, right? So when we talk about microservices, like I'll put up a few uh, example definitions. So small autonomous services that work together. So that's one of the definitions and this is one other definition. Developing a single application as a suit of small services, each running in its own process, communicating with lightweight mechanisms, often HTTP. And the definition is coming. So, thing is, there is not really a single accepted definition of a microservice, right? So, what is? I mean, actually, this is another yet another definition, which is from Martin Fowler. So, this is basically bare minimum centralized management of these services, and obviously, you can write them in different programming languages and use different data storage technologies. Right. So, for me, when I talk about microservices, for me, uh, this is kind of the most important point when we talk about microservices. Right. So, your services should be well defined. That's number one. That's why rest is on top. So, whatever services that we are creating, 
these are uh, well defined, so well thought out. And the second important thing is uh, having the right boundaries. So one of the that's one of the important challenges as well. I mean, identifying the boundaries is not such an easy thing with microservices. As with any good design, identifying the right boundaries is not an easy thing, and the same applies to microservices as well. So for microservices, for me, are REST uh, combined with uh, well chosen deployable units. So I mean, small well chosen deployable units with the right boundaries, and the most important part of the microservices is its cloud enabled, right? So what do I mean by cloud enabled is you'd be able to take the application and dynamically, like it would be, it should be dynamically scalable in the sense that when there is high load, you should be able to increase uh, the number of instances automatically. So these are really the three points which makes a microservice. Unless, I mean, whenever we are trying to think about microservices, Whenever you are trying to design a microservice, whenever these, somebody asks you to come up with a microservice, one of the most important thing is you need to be able to also work out a way where you will be able to dynamically scale it. So you, uh, cloud enabling is that. So it's basically the point where I will be able to scale up and scale down automatically based on the load. So these are the three important things for me. It's having good design in terms of your services, having right boundaries, plus cloud enabling. So cloud enabling, it does not mean you have to deploy it in the cloud. It means if you need to deploy it in the cloud, you can do that. And you'll be able to automatically like scale up and scale down. You can dynamically provision everything and you'll be able to scale up and scale down. So those three are kind of the most important factors for me when it comes to microservices. And let's uh, just look at a couple of pictures. Uh, it's a uh, GUI application talking to a large database. If I was designing it in a microservice architecture, it would look something like this, right? So you have a variety of databases, and each of these services might be implemented using different technologies. So it's basically smaller services talking to disparate data sources. Yeah. Right. So that's that's a good, very good question. I think uh, we'll talk about it a little later when we talk about uh, events. Like, what? Um, are, do you follow the technology radar from ThoughtWorks? No. Okay. So one of the important things that was there in uh, technology uh, radar was start seeing events as the source of data and. Like the way we need to think about data changes when it comes to microservices. And you're right, I mean, having separate databases makes it difficult. But uh, when we go towards microservices architecture, one of the important things that we would see is we would start building applications around events. And uh, the final data in the database might not be the source of truth anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take that question later after we discuss it, right? So you are talking about why you have separate databases, but why not have one database? We'll talk about it. Uh, from a design perspective, I may not always want to uh, maybe start building all those five services that I see there. Absolutely. Maybe I'll start with three of them. Right. And then I start adding more functionality as time goes by. Right. Uh, as as and when needed. Absolutely. So which means there is a lot of pressure on me uh, to make sure that my initial design is bang on. So if if, uh, if if I even decide to adopt microservices, let us say a few months after I've started developing. Right. So how does that change things? And how advantageous is it to you know, pick up microservices somewhere in between the life cycle of uh, you know building the application. Okay, so what what you are really talking about is mi migration to microservices, right? So you already have an application, and you want to migrate it to a kind of a microservices architecture, right? So that's that's kind of the problem which uh, like maybe sixty to seventy percent of the organizations are trying to solve today, and the 
Thing is, there is no one answer to it, right? So, thing is, how you do microservices is completely different from how you do monolith applications, right? Because when it comes to microservices, as we would see later, you would see that you need a lot more automation and a lot of, like, you want to automate deployment, you want to be automating the infrastructure. So, all that, you would not be able to perfect in one day, right? So, it's not, you would not be able to switch from this to this in one day. It would be more like a slow migration. So, you would start with one application. It would be more of a, you start with, you would start identifying what is the right application for me to start with to try microservices, right? So, that's the first question that you try and ask. Then you try and identify, like the most important thing is that particular part should need the dynamic scalability, right? So, that's that's the most important thing, right? You, you need to identify a part which would uh, need uh, like like the dynamics, like the dynamic provisioning and things like that. So you need to identify a part and kind of try that first, and then kind of identify the path for the rest of the applications to move there. So it's not going to be a one day or uh, like it might be actually a multi-year project to be able to switch from uh, a monolith to a microservices application. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Design is, I think this is not a good approach to have multiple DBs, right? Because in my project, currently we follow the same architecture where we have multiple databases and we sync the databases using Kafka. Okay. Kafka or uh, some, some MQs. So right. We usually face issues. Okay. So, so this is what I feel is like this approach is, yeah, like whenever there is a record inserted in one DB, we sync using Kafka. Right. Either. So design wise, it's like, so design wise, this approach is not suitable in current situation. What I feel is, okay. we'll talk about that a little later, right? So there are always advantages with going with one database, but there are also disadvantages associated with it, right? So you need to find the right data. I mean, it might just be that you have data boundaries are not right, right? So if I have five databases like this, and I have one database which is broken down to this, it might be that you have not broken it down in the right way. Unless and until it is a master slave DB, I don't think having a multiple DBs is a good idea. Right, but that's very generic statement to me, right? Uh, so it's I would say that I would more I would be more looking at the problem statement and then trying to identify what is the data that is replicating between DB12 and DB3. Yeah, if, so if what kind of data is there? So is that business correct. critical information? If that's business critical information, then I would not have it in the Until and unless DB1 is not communicating to DB2, so microservice 1 is not communicating to microservice 2. Right. I don't think that there is no need, I mean, yeah, depending on the data as well. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, I, I would want to have the most business critical information in three places replicated, right? So it also depends on what kind of information you're trying to replicate as well. Just to ask a small question. Please go. When you said that it might take years, if you are in an early stage, let's right. say you're just building out a product, alpha beta stage, right. at that time if you want to move to, let's say, you know, microservices, you've right. your app, but now you want to make a shift, what implication does that have in terms of time? Right. So, what you're talking about is, you have already built a monolith, it's not live. Yes, it's not in production. Yeah, it's pre-production. Um, it depends on how big it is, right? So, if it's uh, like if it's in an early stage and if it's designed well, I mean, if it would also it would depend a lot on how your services are defined. If it's defined with proper APIs and stuff, even though these APIs are not split up, it might be easy to break it down. But if it's built uh, not with APIs and like uh, half as early, then it would it might be difficult to. This is, it's very difficult to give an answer without looking at the application itself, right? One small request. Uh, you had mentioned earlier on that you're going to be focusing on uh, the uh, frameworks for Java. Right. right. Uh, when we had a raise of hands, very few were on Java. So if you could also add other backend, let's say Node or anything else which the group might. Okay. So if you could add it in parallel. Okay. Like, let's say you have Java and these frameworks, but you have, let's say, Node, how right. would you move to about it? Okay. Uh, I'm not an expert on other frameworks, so I can actually touch up on them, but I would not be able to give details on them. Yeah, <laughs> cool. So I have one question. Yeah. So when you think of microservices, you 
Yes, that's the recommended approach. Uh, the recommended approach is each of the services should be independent. And by independent, it means the entire uh, vertical structure. So it's recommended to be like multiple databases, but when you are migrating from monolith to a microservice kind of approach, then you might have a little bit of duplication of data as well as you might be sharing a database as well. But uh, ideally the recommended structure is something of this kind, yeah. So these are literally separate web applications, each one of them that are working together? These are uh, APIs, yes. These are APIs which are being exposed, talking to a, a like, variety of data sources. So, so if I'm talking in terms of Java, Right. If I am talking in terms of Java, so each of these is like, let us say, one jar file talking to, let us say, one table. Something like that? Have I got it right? A component, right? It can be a jar file. If you are talking about, like, typical web applications, it might be a bar file. Right. 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 Yeah. That's it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ranga, uh, can you also repeat the question uh, once uh, someone asks? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, and this is how the communication might look like it, not in all the situations, but when you talk about microservices architectures, you would have a lot of microservices interacting with each other. So, you, you might have a number of calls going with, between these microservices, right? So, yeah, we already talked about the advantages, right? So, you'd be able to adapt to technology quickly because these are small independent components to be able to try new technologies much more easily. So if you want to try Node.js or any of this other stuff, then you would be able to try it very easily. Uh, faster release cycles, uh, because these are small components, uh, you can, and most of these have automation tests, you'll be able to release them much more frequently than usual. And... Let's say I have five microservices talking to the single DB. So can I call it as a microservice? Uh, we'll, shall we take the database thing a little later? Yeah. yeah? Is that good? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's get back to the uh, scaling part of it, right? So, uh, the one of the most important advantages of microservices is, like, when I have multiple microservices, based, like, all these microservices might not have the same load on them, right? So, a, microservice, a specific microservice might have much more load if you are uh, talking about a uh, movie application, a movie website, probably the ticket booking thing has much more load compared to the like uh, the pages which display the movie information. So each of these microservices can be scaled independently, right? So you might have just a specific ins one instance of a specific microservice and you might be able to have multiple instances of uh, the second microservice and like just to for the microservice one. With monolith applications, we did not have that flexibility, right? So you like it's you need to if you want to have ten instances, is the ten instances of the entire monolith application. But here you have more flexibility in terms of how you want to scale. But the most important thing with chat, uh, microservices is that uh, it does not come free, right? It's there are a lot of challenges which are associated with developing microservices and. Let's uh, look at a few of them now. Uh, one of the important things that we already talked about is quick setup, right? So you cannot, because you want to develop a number of small components, you cannot spend uh, like two weeks, three weeks to set each of these microservices up. You want to be able to quickly set up a microservice and get going with it. Uh, obviously, automation is very, very important, right? So you have 20 microservices, 100 microservices, you want to be able to deploy them, you want to be able to test them automatically. So automation becomes a crucial part. Starting from how you create the microservice, starting uh, how you test it, uh, how you deploy it, and all the dynamic provisioning and all that part of it as well. So automation is a very critical thing when it comes to microservices. And typically, like organizations which are using monolith architectures are not ready with all the things which are needed for automation, right? So that's one of the important challenges. Um, visibility is another important challenge. What, is, what do I mean by visibility? Um, when we talk about microservices, we, like the call chains will be something of this kind. So you'd have 
a number of microservices calling each other, and you have a number of microservices also, right? So if something goes down, you want to be able to know that immediately, right? So if a microservice is down or if there are faults coming up from a specific microservice, you want to be able to know that very quickly. And also if you have a problem, let's say there's a problem in microservice code or there's a bug which is present, you are trying to debug something. You want to be able to see what is happening behind the screens of each of these microservices very easily. So they, that's where visibility is very important. You want to be able to monitor them and also see uh, like what's happening behind these microservices in a very easy kind of a way. So that's a challenge when it comes to microservice. Uh, the biggest challenge for me when it comes to microservices is the bounded context, right? So you want to be able to identify the boundaries of what like what should each microservice do? How many microservices should I have? What is the boundary of each of these microservices? So that's kind of the most important challenge when it comes to microservices because when we talk about microservices, you'll be able to get the real benefit only when you'll be able to independently deploy them. So if I, if I make a change and I have to change 15 microservices along with it, then your microservice architecture is not serving the purpose, right? So the real, uh, Purpose would be served only if you are able to identify the right boundary for these microservices and develop them in that way. And what I've found is identifying the right boundary is not going to be like an easy task as well. It's not something which you'll be able to say, like I'll understand this domain in one day and sit down and do the design. It's more something which would evolve over a period of time. So uh, like one of the uh, keys uh, to identifying the right boundaries for the microservices is uh, bounded context how many of you have read the book Domain Driven Design, right? So I think in Domain Driven Design, uh, they talk about bounded context and taking the concept of bounded context and applying it to the microservices have is one of the ways of uh, identifying the right boundaries for your microservices. With respect to microservices, uh, how does it uh, relate to containers and container management? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll come back to that. I'll probably give a quick answer right now and see if I can come back to it, right? So one of the important things I, would, I was talking about is dynamic provisioning, right? So you want to be able to see the load and directly adjust, right? So if I have less load, probably less instances, the moment the load increases, I would want to be able to pull up a new instance of the microservice, right? How do I create a new instance of the microservice dynamically? Today, the best way is like, for example, container management, Kubernetes is one of the best ways. So as soon as you say, tell the Kubernetes, okay, this is the container, you manage it. As soon as the load goes beyond this, you just uh, pull in a new instance of this container. So container is basically your application with all the soft, all the things that you need uh, for developing that, right? So your application plus uh, JVM plus uh, the OS. So you have to use a container management system for microservices. Yeah, if you want to be able to dynamically provision, yes, it's one of the uh, up, most have. popular approaches today. It is a must have. Uh, it's and because you want to scale and deploy it. Right. So I mean, I would say it's like ninety-nine percent of the scenarios it's used. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, the other important challenge when it comes to microservices is configuration management, right? So you have, instead of having one application, you have multiple smaller microservices. That means you need to manage the configuration for each one of those microservices, right? What are the services I need to talk to? What are the application business related configuration that I have? I would need to start managing all that for 100 different microservices for all the multiple environments and multiple instances which are present. So your configuration instead of having uh, 50 different configurations, probably you would have 500, 600 different configurations which are present. And the most important thing, right, without dynamic scale up and dynamic scale down, uh, there is no meaning in going for microservices. So you, not, you need to be able to have all the like technology to be able to make use of the dynamic provisioning which is provided. And Obviously, it's like a pack of cards, right? In the earlier picture, we saw microservice one calling two, three, calling three, four, five. So, if let's say microservice five is down, all the other stuff is down. So, it's like a pack of cards. 
unless you have the right fault tolerance built in, there's a chance that the entire architecture would collapse. I mean, if some one microservice is down, uh, it can pull down the entire application. I mean, entire all the microservices down. And debugging is going to be a difficult challenge that we already talked about. <coughs> and having consistency is also a, a big challenge because you have um, because we have a lot of uh, different microservices which are present, like 20, 30, 40. Uh, you don't want each of these to have different designs, right? You would want flexibility in terms of trying new things, but you would want a little bit of consistency among them also. So how you design something, how you develop something, and how you test something, and how you deploy it, you need consistency in terms of how you develop it as well as how you, like, what are the tools that you use and all that kind of stuff. So that achieving that level of consistency is also a challenge when it comes to microservices, right? So typically we have governance boards or like decentralized, like uh, more like uh, the, the leads from teams or the development leads from the teams, kind of forming a kind of a guild and coming together to make sure that we have an identified pattern of how we develop the microservices, right? So having that kind of a thing to ensure everybody is consistent is very important. I mean, you have to leave flexibility for innovation. I mean, you want to be able to try new things, but you should not try new things every other product, right? So it's more like you have a standard, you have a defined approach, and then you kind of deviate from it based on some reasons. So tip, uh, before going to solutions, we'll take a 15 minute break. Um, we'll be back at 7.45, is that cool? Yeah, uh, we can have a 10 minutes break probably. Okay. We have a lot of content to cover maybe. Yeah. Um, so we have snacks placed over there. You can just grab them and come back. Thank you.